Hello there everyone, my name is Dylan and welcome to a brand new video. Today I'm going to be testing you how well you can understand fast spoken English. Right guys, remember to like, subscribe and enjoy the video. Let's do this. Sorry, sorry, that was a bit fast, I know. Let me redo that. Hi there, my name is Dylan and welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be helping you to understand fast spoken English. So obviously that introduction was a little bit of an exaggeration. However, I think it's fair to say that sometimes when you are talking to native speakers or if you are watching English TV shows or films, sometimes we do speak a little bit too quickly and it can be hard to understand. You know, all of the words just start merging together and your brain goes into early retirement. If that sounds about right, then this is the video for you. So, how does it work? Well, it's quite fun, actually. I'll be reading you some random books at varying speeds and you just need to listen and then answer a question based on the text. I will start slow and then get faster and faster and faster and in total there are 10 questions for you to answer. So feel free to grab a pen and paper if you would like, however it's not essential. Right guys, enjoy the video. Number one and we are going to start slow. I will be reading you a passage from the classic novel One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss. So just so you know, throughout this whole video, I'm only going to be reading each passage once. It's not because I'm lazy. It's just because it is better practice for you and you can always replay it if you'd like to. So the first question is, how many different colors of fish are there? One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. Okay, so very tricky stuff, I know. Can you just tell me your answer, please? Yeah, well, if you said there are three different colors of fish, then well done, because you are correct. So we have red fish, blue fish, black fish, and blue fish. Of course, they said bluefish twice, so in total, there are three different colours. Number two, and let's go for one more from this book. So the question is, how many animals have come to cool? I do not like this bed at all. A lot of things have come to cool. A cow, a dog, a cat, a mouse. Oh, what a bed. Oh, what a house. Okay, if you have answered with four, then congratulations, you are correct. We have a cow, a dog, a cat, and a mouse. Right, let's up the difficulty. Winnie the Pooh. The question is, where was the loud buzzing noise coming from? One day, when he was out walking, he came to an open place in the middle of the forest. And in the middle of this place was a large oak tree. And from the top of the tree, there came a loud buzzing noise. Winnie the Pooh sat down at the foot of the tree, put his head between his paws and began to think. So, if you answered by saying that the noise was coming from the top of the tree, then congratulations, because you are correct. In the middle of this place was a large oak tree and from the top of the tree there came a loud buzzing noise. I wonder what that noise could be. Let's get a bit faster. Question 4 comes from the Bear Nobody Wanted from Janet and Alan Olberg. So we are sticking with the bear theme for now. The question is, when you are making a bear what might you need kapok and wood wool for? So those are both materials, by the way, but what for? This is how a bear was made many years ago. The materials used were brown plush for the fur, velvet or felt for the paws, and strong black thread for the nose and mouth. In addition, the following things were needed one pair of glass eyes, five disc joints for attaching the head, arms and legs to the body, 
and lots of kapok or wood wool for the filling. Sometimes an extra item such as a squeaker was included. Ribbons too, usually red and in the form of a bow, were popular then. So the answer is... Sorry, just bear with me. And lots of kapok or wood wool for the filling. So the filling is what goes inside the bear, by the way. So the bear's innards. Question five, and we are going to do one more from this book. So according to the text, what did Mr. Hardy's umbrella have? Mr. Hardy was a quirky man. He liked to surprise people and he liked to be different. On his desk there was a notice saying, this is a notice, his umbrella had a duck's head handle and his car was green, an unusual colour in those days. He enjoyed a joke and mostly saw the funny side of things. On April Fool's Day, though, he was a man to avoid. Mr Hardy returned to his office and showed the bear to his secretary. Caught him trying to escape, he said. So Mr Hardy is a quirky man. He has a green car, a weird notice on his desk, and he also has an umbrella with a duck's head handle. That's cute. I need one of those. It's not actually a duck's head, by the way. It's made out of plastic. I hope, anyway. Right. Let's up the difficulty again. Question six will be coming from the Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. So, which two words does the author use to describe the idea of letting your happiness be determined by things outside of your control? I'm going to give you a little hint here. We're looking for an adjective and then a noun. If your happiness is dependent on accomplishing certain goals, what happens if fate intervenes? What if you're snubbed? If outside events interrupt? What if you do achieve everything but find that nobody is impressed? That's the problem with letting your happiness be determined by things you can't control. It's an insane risk. If an actor focuses on the public reception to a project, whether critics like it or whether it's a hit, they will be constantly disappointed and hurt. But if they love their performance and put everything they have into making it the best they're capable of, they will always find satisfaction in their job. Like them, we should take pleasure from our actions, in taking the right action rather than the results that come from them. Let me read that passage again. So, what if you do achieve everything but find that nobody is impressed? That's the problem with letting your happiness be determined by things you can't control. It's an insane risk. So that is the answer. An insane risk. It's very risky. And that is so true as well. You should never put your emotions into something that is completely outside of your control because you're only setting yourself up for disappointment and, well, depression, really. You know, Dylan Aurelius, the stoic God, hi, nice to meet you. For the next question, please allow me to bestow some more stoic wisdom upon you. I am going to be speaking quite fast, by the way. So, according to the text, what is the most human approach to life? Laugh or cry? Heraclitus would shed tears whenever he went out in public. Democritus laughed. One saw the whole as a parade of miseries, the other of follies. And so we should take a lighter view of things and bear them with an easy spirit, for it is more human to laugh at life than to lament it. Seneca, On Tranquility of Mind, 15.2. Whew, okay, right. So according to Seneca, the dude I was just quoting, we should take a lighter view of things and bear them with an easy spirit. For it is more human to laugh at life than to lament it. So that is the answer. You should laugh at life instead of lamenting it. And by the way, in this context, if you lament something, it just means you express a lot of disappointment or regret towards that thing. This book, by the way, is just full of absolute facts. We should all be living the stoic lifestyle, really. However, it is a lot easier said than done. I know not everyone can be the stoic god, the stoic brick that I am. But you know, we can try. By the way, this book features a different stoic quote for every day of the year. 
This video should be coming out on May the 22nd, so please allow me to bestow a final piece of Stoic wisdom upon you. May the 22nd. Today is the day. You get what you deserve. Instead of being a good person today, you choose instead to become one tomorrow. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. I want you to really think about that, all right? Question eight, and things are getting serious. I will be reading you a passage from The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. I This is just a random book I found. It does look cool though. It's got a nice hardback cover to it. So yeah, enjoy. So the question is, what two things does Mary like about the secret garden? You ready? Okay. The sun shone down for nearly a week on the secret garden. The secret garden was what Mary called it when she was thinking of it. She liked the name and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut her in, no one knew where she was. It seemed almost like being shut out of the world in some fairy place. The few books she had read and liked had been fairy story books and she had read of secret gardens in some of these stories. Sometimes people went to sleep in them for a hundred years, which she thought must be rather stupid. Oh my goodness. Right. So the important part is... She liked the name, and she liked still more the feeling that when its beautiful old walls shut in, no one knew where she was. So she likes the name, she likes the fact that these huge walls, um, they're so big and beautiful, and oh my goodness, that was so tiring. Anyway, when she's in, <laughs> when she's in this secret garden, no one knows where she is, and that is one of the reasons why she likes it. Right, two more questions then, and good luck as I'm going to be speaking rather quickly. So the next passage comes from a book called Dear Tom, written by a man called Tom Courtenay. So this is Tom here, and Mr Courtenay is a British actor and author. I'll be reading you a letter sent to Tom by his beloved mother. The question is, which three adjectives does the mother use to describe how she would feel if she were in the granny's situation. So we are looking for three adjectives. Dear Tom. Christmas is getting near. We're starting the decorating in about two weeks. Your father distempered out the gas cupboard last night. I've been to granny's this afternoon. The landlord came in. He was playing hell because she wouldn't pay her rent. It is only £2.16 a month. She goes in the club every night of the week. It isn't in her nature to pay her way. She made a cup of tea and never turned her hair. I would have been sick and worried and ashamed. She came out of the house with me and she had to go to the doctors for tablets for her leg. Do you get that? Right, so we have a granny here who isn't paying her rent. When the landlord came to collect it, in true British fashion, she made him a cup of tea and just completely ignored the subject. No hard conversations to be had. So, the mother said that she would feel sick, worried and ashamed if she were the granny in that situation. So sick, worried and ashamed. Well done if you got that right. Question number 10, which is the final question, and that might be for the best because my throat is starting to get a little bit sore. Anyway, for this final one, I've decided to read a passage from the most British book I could possibly ever think of. So who could it be? Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare, J.K. Rowling, maybe some Jane Austen? No, 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 none of that, none of that. I am going to be reading from the 2021 National Trust handbook, mate. So the National Trust is a charity in the UK who basically look after and maintain historic landmarks and just nice green spaces around the country. The whole point is that if they do this, then the future generations can also enjoy them. They are pretty much one of the most British organisations that I could ever think of. Anyway, we are going to be reading about a place called Greenway in the southwest of England. The question is, what is the significance of the Dart Estuary and the Boathouse? Greenway. Greenway Road, Gompton, near Brixham, Devon. TQ50ES. You ready? Okay. 
Here you are given a glimpse into the lives of the famous author Agatha Christie and her family. Their holiday home is set in the 1950s where Greenway overflowed with friends and family gathered together for holidays on Christmas. The family were great collectors. The house is bringing with their books, archaeology, tumbridgeware, silver and porcelain. The informal woodland garden drifts towards the hillside towards the dart estuary and the boathouse, scene of the crime and dead man's folly. Please consider green ways to travel here. Ferry, courtesy vehicle available from quay, cycling or walking. Note, booking essential for parking. Right, so the significance of the dart estuary and the boathouse is that it was the scene of the crime in Dead Man's Folly, which is a very famous Agatha Christie novel. So, the informal woodland garden drifts down the hillside towards the Dart Estuary and the Boathouse, scene of the crime in Dead Man's Folly. So I guess Agatha Christie would come to this lovely place in the 1950s and would write some of her best work there, which, which is nice, of course. So we're going to end this very arduous and um, book-filled video with a big old shout out to the one and only Agatha Christie. Right guys, and there we have it. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, why not consider liking the video and maybe subscribing to the channel as well. Both of those things are massively appreciated. Why not comment below and let me know what your favourite book from today's video was as well. We have we've had quite a few good ones. Winnie the Pooh, uh, Secret Garden. This was a good one. The Bear Nobody Wanted. Um, National Trust, of course. And, you know, my personal favourite, Dr. Zeus. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. This has got to be the best one for me. I'm not too sure how it ends. When I do finally finish reading it, I will let you know. Right guys, this video has absolutely taken it out of me. So cheers for watching and I will see you um, some, I don't know, next video. Bye.